Th thanks, Leith, for that introduction. And really a pleasure to be with you all today to talk about um, child pneumonia, the pandemic, and our perspective from Lesotho. So I structured the talk to revisit some of the pre-pandemic uh, situation and then to discuss the, the pandemic and how and kind of how it transpired in Lesotho and um, what we were contributing um, in partnership with the government uh, during the pandemic period. And then we'll talk a little bit about the post-pandemic period as well, uh, opportunities, challenges, um, and so on. So starting in the pre-pandemic, and then we'll move forward from there. So Leith covered this as well, but you know, just to reframe us and, and focus on what we're talking about, um, you know, the distribution of child pneumonia uh, prior to the pandemic um, and moving forward really has been uh, concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as South Asia, as depicted here. The main child factors driving pneumonia mortality, young age, HIV, malnutrition, hypoxemia, and obviously the big environmental contribution of air pollution being important. What did the child pneumonia care pathway look like um, prior to the pandemic? Well, you know, it's largely characterized uh, by a lot of efforts going into increasing access to uh, vaccines like PCV or pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, um, haemophilus influenza, uh, continuing high access to measles, um, from a diagnostic perspective, particularly outside of hospitals, um, we've been, I would say, somewhat stuck um, on uh, diagnostics and relying mainly on uh, counting respirations with stopwatches. Um, this has largely proven to be ineffective um, and, and by and large, uh, you know, has been largely abandoned in during day to day practice by healthcare workers such that really the reality is that most children who access uh, a healthcare uh, setting who have a cough or fever, the vast majority of them will get treated with an antibiotic like amoxicillin. Um, and in thinking about amoxicillin as the mainstay child pneumonia antibiotic treatment, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, still using a lot of non-dispersible tablets uh, that are intended for adults, as well as um, syrups and suspensions that can tend to be difficult for caregivers to administer well. Referral systems, uh, mainly informal um, using a lot of public transport. And this poses a lot of challenges for children and their families to move fluidly through the health system. Um, so the result is often there's delays in referral uh, where children are accessing various touch points of the health system later than they should and they're more severely ill. Pulse oximetry is a key um, intervention uh, that's been around for decades now. Um, but in LMICs like Lesotho, uh, when it's available, it's at the hospital level. Um, these have not been designed for children in mind, uh, and the quality of them can vary quite substantially. Uh, so they're definitely not uh, available outside of the, the hospital level. And then oxygen systems prior to the pandemic, particularly outside of uh, the tertiary referral setting, um, basically have been, had been ignored. Uh, in a state like pictured here, um, meaning that essentially children who needed oxygen by and large were not identified and were not accessing oxygen uh, at all. And so that's a, a glance at the system, uh, the, the, you know, the, the pathway for children prior to the pandemic in LMICs. And then the pandemic arrived um, in the Southern Africa uh, setting Really, that was middle of 2020, if we can kind of take our minds back there. And I can speak to the context of Lesotho. Um, I was based in Lesotho uh, at this time as a pulmonologist. Uh, and, you know, the, the takeaways from this slide are really around the fact Lesotho is a, it's a small country, um, rural, mountainous, uh, has a high HIV population, um, uniquely surrounded completely by South Africa. So very dependent on the South African health system, and when COVID hit, um, you know the 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 borders were closed um, for the first time uh, really ever, uh, and it uh, they continued to be closed for nearly a year, and that uh, really revealed a lot of the weaknesses um, that 
um, the health system was was struggling with. Um, there is no high care um, uh, unit availability uh, at, at district hospital levels, and there's 10 administrative districts, each with a hospital. Um, two of those 10 hospitals were re established to be national referral centers for COVID, one serving the northern part of the country, Berea as pictured here, uh, the other um, Mafetang in the southern part of the country. But by and large, both of these hospitals at the start of the pandemic, again, had little to no oxygen, uh, very few personnel, um, and it was really a, um, just um, a space for people to, to receive care. Um, the, there is a tertiary referral center in the capital um, that has the only level three ICU uh, in the country. Uh, it is uh, where there is mechanical ventilation available, but this was not available to patients with COVID uh, at, uh, during this time period. Um, there is restricted access to that. So there's basically no, no intensive care. And so as we started to support the government, um, I um, so was working with uh, funding from the USAID through this RISE mechanism uh, through JAPAIGO, which is a public health affiliate of Johns Hopkins. Um, and we, you know, historically, a lot of the support that has uh, come to Lesotho as well as other uh, countries in this way tends to be verticalized, um, really focused on HIV, TB, not necessarily as much on system strengthening. It became very clear uh, quite early um, that that was going to need to be the focus was on system strengthening. Um, and so we were supporting direct patient care as pictured here, um, but we needed to pivot pretty quickly to think through what was the most feasible and um, uh, approach or strategy for delivering respiratory care that had the highest chance of being successful and sustainable. And there, at this time, if you remember, there was a lot of focus on distribution of mechanical ventilators. Um, our uh, strategy that we had recommended and we focused on was on the basics, making sure that we can do conventional oxygen well, um, making sure that we can do monitoring well of patients, uh, resuscitation, and then layer on top of that um, advanced respiratory care like high flow which matches a lot of the skill set of the healthcare workers because it does have a lot of parallels to conventional oxygen and over time to build towards um, non-invasive ventilation and invasive mechanical ventilation. So that was a strategy that we employed. Our trainings were centered around that pulse oximetry, oxygen high flow, resuscitation. We um, you know, spent a lot of time supporting infrastructure development, including installation of high care units. And with really key collaborations, you know, and partner support was really uh, important. Um, uh, MSF was a key partner for us um, and the government in terms of getting oxygen into one of the treatment centers to really enable us to do high care, high flow well. Um, there's a lot of work on algorithm development in terms of oxygen, high flow, comorbidity uh, management uh, that fed into national guidelines a lot of support on direct human resource, uh, you know, getting people um, into the treatment centers uh, to staff them so we can do patient monitoring appropriately. And then lastly, on um, developing tools that can be used both at the patient and facility level, as well as that can provide monitoring and surveillance. And so that was one of the contributions as well in terms of having a more formalized um, case report forms that would help to standardize hospital level care, but also to produce data that we could learn from as we go. And there was a lot of learning as we went. Um, and then also an oxygen dashboard to take a kind of a non-existent oxygen system and to reorganize it so that we could be, be sure that uh, facilities were not stocking out of oxygen. And I think really appropriately to say is that all of this was focused really mainly on adults for the first part of the pandemic. And then we did over time, you know, pivot to enrich all of this with, pedi with pediatric um, uh, elements. And so in terms of during the pandemic, that's the Lesotho perspective, but what about child pneumonia? There's, there's not a lot I could say in terms of uh, child pneumonia from Lesotho specifically, but 
Um, I've been very fortunate to be um, working with colleagues on the HAPPEN trial, uh, which is a four country clean cook stove randomized trial where pregnant women are randomized to a clean cook stove. Uh, and, um, and then we, we follow their offspring out to one year of age. Um, and one of the endpoints that um, I've been responsible for is the severe child pneumonia endpoint. And you can see here from these graphs that the y-axis is uh, cumulative cases of severe child pneumonia, all of these kids below a year of age, x-axis is time, the blue bar here is cumulative cases observed, and then the red line here is when COVID, uh, a lot of the mitigation uh, intervention started. And you can see basically whether it's Rwanda, Peru, Guatemala, or India, the trajectory of cases either bent pretty severely, uh, lower, or it disappeared altogether, um, indicating um, most likely, you know, that a lot of the indirect uh, mitigation efforts, not being in school, masking, and so on, really eliminated a lot of the viral transmission that was laying underneath the severe pneumonia cases. And so then what about post-pandemic, at least, you know, behaviorally we're moving into a post-pandemic phase. You know, it's still kind of foggy as depicted here and we're learning. Um, but just to say that, you know, here in, in, in South Africa, uh, Southern Africa region, and specifically South Africa, we've gone through the, the, as a Southern hemisphere country, gone through winter and we have seen a huge um, surge, you know, in virus and viruses and lower respiratory illness. Um, kind of capture a little bit that here where I'm circling. Um, and this does seem to be now as the Northern hemisphere moves into winter to be replicating itself. Um, so there does seem to be a lot of viruses circulating. Kids are unmasked, they're back in school. Um, and so there's a lot more viruses circulating, and then there are there are potentially more vulnerable children who are naive to these viruses, or who may, um, because of the the impact of the pandemic, you know, vaccine programs, nutrition programs, PMTCT programs have potentially been disrupted, creating an even more vulnerable population of children. And then, what does the 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 care pathway system look like right now? you know, what's kind of the, the and where can we go in the, moving forward? So I've mentioned the vaccines earlier that, that were PCV, Hib. Well, you know, we've learned, of course, together that mRNA technology can be very effective and safe. And there's some products, uh, particularly with the RSV space, that are in the pipeline. And that can be a very exciting contribution and something that we learned through uh, the COVID pandemic. Pulse oximeters, you know, we've seen a lot of devices come in into Lesotho. I know this has been in other settings as well. And so we now have the ability to potentially have pulse oximeters, not just at hospital, but at the health center, even down to the community level. But I would caution here with a but statement in the sense that, you know, the, the devices are still not um, designed for children necessarily. Um, the quality of the devices uh, varies quite considerably. And then we do have the, the elephant of the room in terms of the algorithms potentially having a racial bias uh, in play. And I wanted to just to flag this website, Open Oximetry. Um, Dr. Mike Lipnick and UCSF colleagues have been doing a ton of work in this space. Please visit that website. And there's a lot of really key information on device testing. In terms of diagnostics, really quickly, you know, again, as I said initially, we just have to move beyond stopwatches. Um, and so whether that's going to be, you know, um, computerized electronic, electronic decision support with tablets or long ultrasound or digital stethoscopes or biomarkers, I think the field is still trying to sort through which one or what combination of these will be. But I think that's going to be very important in terms of us um, uh, being more mindful with antibiotics and having um, uh, more antibiotic stewardship. In terms of antibiotics, um, dispersible tablets still need to be ramped up further, and so that's an ongoing thing. Um, referral system formalization. So this has been a problem for a long time, and in COVID, in Lesotho specifically, there's been a lot of investment now into the referral system, and we really hope to see that continue so that we can have, you know, formal, um, you know, formal, formal vehicles with well-trained paramedics with a dispatch system so that we can move 
uh, people, including children, through the system more fluidly. And then lastly, a lot of work in the oxygen system space, you know, whether it's oxygen concentrators, PSA plants, liquid oxygen, we've seen a lot of this investment in Lesotho. I know it's happening in other places, algorithm development, um, laying the foundation for more advanced respiratory care like high flow. It's going to be really key that we can maintain these um, investments so that they don't backslide into this picture on the right like we had prior to the pandemic. And I think in terms of key questions for children is really kind of how, how will high flow play a role? I think my feeling in walking away from this to some extent is that high flow is something that can be delivered further down in the health system, perhaps more readily than other forms of non-invasive ventilation. So I just wanted to leave kind of on that note, you know, I think the, for, for me, the takeaway on the pandemic and child pneumonia is really around system strengthening. That's going to be the key um, for this momentum to move forward. And I really hope that donor sponsors kind of hear that message um, and that we, there will always be verticalization, I suppose, to some extent, but system strengthening is going to be really important. And I did want to make everyone aware that there's a new child pneumonia working group from the, the, the union that will be launching uh, very soon. I'm co-directing with uh, Dr. Rebecca Nantanda from Uganda, Dr. Matthew Kelly from Duke. Um, we really hope that you become a member and we tackle some of these problems together. And of course, we really look forward to continuing to collaborate with Every Breath Counts and Foundation Maru on these important issues. So thanks, everybody.